Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you have all had a very nice lunch and some interesting conversations with some good networking opportunities between delegates. Before I progress with our speaker for today, I have a quick and important announcement to make. So we are very delighted to announce the launch of the Work Economic Summit app, where you can stay up to date with all the events running throughout the summit. You will be able to see a list of our speakers, their bios, and add them to your own personal timetable alongside a helpful campus map for those of you visiting Warwick for the first time. So just head over to the link in our Instagram bio at Warwick Economic Summit to be able to download the app on both iOS and Android. So as you may have noticed in our speaker lineup this year, we have not only one, but two Nobel Economic Laureates. So it is my honor today to introduce the winner of the 2010 Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences winner, Professor Peter Diamond. Attending Yale University, Peter Diamond considered doing a major in engineering, but decided to pursue a master's degree instead. In fact, he never really delved into economics until his second year, where he undertook a year-long introductory uh, economics course, and his interest in the field was immediately ignited. Taking on his first economics-related job as a research assistant, Professor Diamond said that an important part of education is learning to recognize the value of what you stumble over, as well as choosing research topics with a sense of how valuable possible findings might be. Over his career, Professor Diamond has engaged with policy analysis, especially with regards to pensions, as they align closely with his interests in public finance and social concerns. Peter Diamond often used a quote by Franklin Roosevelt when talking about his work. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have too much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. In 2010, Peter Diamond was awarded the Nobel Prize for his work on a theoretical framework for market research friction, the models of which help us to gain insight into how unemployment, job vacancies, and wages are impacted by economic policy. So please join me in giving a massive round of applause to the wonderful Professor Peter Diamond. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, assuming that I am now live. And it may surprise you given the, what I'm guessing is the average age of the audience that I'm talking about pensions rather than talking about searching for jobs. I'm doing that for two reasons. One is uh, analysis of pensions brings up a host of issues that don't get much attention in an undergraduate education, but are extremely important for a wide range of policy analyses. Uh, the second reason is that it's very much in the news. So here's a headline from the New York Times and the start of the story. I'm sure whatever newspapers you looked at or TV news you've seen uh, are not surprised uh, that there are considerable um, strikes on in France over pension reform. Needless to say, this is not something new. I went browsing in the Times website uh, and turned up, oh dear. Sorry for that, clumsy fingers. So here is uh, a long ago uh, story from Italy <clears throat> and strikes again and students out in support, not just of pensions, but also uh, issues about school reform. So this is not news, pensions are a big deal and the kinds of issues that come up uh, are often different. Uh, the first two were for government-run system that had limited funding and the need to adapt to the aging going on. Uh, this is a government stepping in and looking at private pensions uh, and uh, taking over money that people thought uh, was there. It's not all bad news in the press. Uh, here's again a, a Times piece uh, about 
how the Dutch um, did a major overhaul. They have done a very good job. The story, which was primarily attacking U.S. policies, uh, greatly exaggerated uh, the smoothness of an adaptation in the Netherlands. Uh, it took uh, roughly 20 years from the dot-com bubble burst, followed by the Great Recession, uh, for them to more or less settle on what's going forward. And in between, uh, there were indeed uh, demonstrations as well. So pensions matter so much because they are a big part of government budgets, um, particularly uh, the national pension, uh, but it, they're also important in budgets for employers and, of course, budgets for the workers paying contributions and eventually getting benefits. The need to make changes in ongoing pension plans is quite widespread. Uh, so here's a list, not a list, a counting uh, of changes across countries. And you can see it is widespread. Uh, it is not just in a small number uh, of places. So moving on, uh, pensions matter uh, and are on the agenda to a great extent because of the aging phenomenon, which of course is quite widespread. And this issue is not going away in a hurry. The need to adapt is going to be there. There are two ways to adapt repeated legislative changes with the chaos that often accompanies them, or the introduction of automatic indexing, changing pension plans in response to what's happening in, in the economy. And I'll say a little bit about that later on. Let me start with a couple of definitions. The phrase pay as you go pension refers to a variety of pensions, including any that had no funding at all, uh, but they also refer as a term to pensions that have considerable funding, but not relying on the funding to determine what's going on. A funded pension accumulates assets, and then those assets are used to pay benefits. And that's the contrast. It's not whether there's funding, but whether the funding drives the level of the benefits, which then adapt to what's happening with the funding, or whether there are rules about the benefits and rules about funding, and they don't always stay together. And there are two standard terms for the type of pension there is. A defined benefit pension uh, has a formula which says, if you have this history of earnings that were subject to contributions, and if you start your benefits at this age, here's what you will get to begin with, and then that benefit level will change over time according to the indexing rules. Usually it varies with either prices or wages in the economy. With a defined contribution pension, the contributions are used to buy assets. The assets are accumulated up until retirement. And then after that, you get access to them. And that access can be in a variety of different ways. So I want to talk about two issues today. Uh, one issue is how to do a better job when you have defined contribution accumulation going on, uh, as is very common with lots of pensions, uh, particularly common in employer organized pensions in the UK. And the second thing I want to touch on, which I've already mentioned, is the use of indexation and how it's slowly spreading across countries. So uh, double click again, come on. Uh, so uh, what I want to indicate is across countries, there are a whole lot of different ways that this goes. Let me start uh, 
with something more appropriate for students. If you decided to do a little work and save on your own, you would buy some assets with it. You might put it into a savings account. You might buy some bonds. You might buy some stocks. When you go to buy whatever you want to accumulate, there is a financial market out there with a large number of different firms offering you access to buying bond stocks, uh, other items. Uh, and those firms might be offering you advice or offering, suggesting that you get advice from somebody outside the firm. Uh, and it's a wide market you have access to. When it comes to a pension, the government in most countries will give you a tax break if you do your savings inside a pension plan, which has penalties if you take it out before retirement age. And that usually involves wide access, although there may be some backups uh, meant to make it easier for you. When you have a national pension plan, then there becomes the issue of how people choose their portfolios. In particular, I'm gonna talk about mandatory pension plans. So the government in Australia requires every worker and employer to make contributions each year, or they do it monthly, uh, to build up assets being held uh, for eventual retirement. The same is true, the other examples that are here, Hong Kong, Chile, and Sweden. UK is a little more complicated, and we may or may not get to it, depends on how fast I talk. So what kinds of rules do they have for access? Well, in Australia, uh, there is a vast array of different friends, different firms that provide asset access for the workers. Employers can set them up, unions can set them up, nonprofits can set them up, financial firms can set them up, and there's a huge array of different plans that you can access. And your employer, once you've picked one, sends your money to the firm you pick. Hong Kong uh, has a wonderful website laying out a vast array of different firms offering asset choices and uh, what kinds of things they offer and details about the funds. And your employer then has to send the money to the firm you choose. In contrast, Chile in 1981, when it pioneered mandatory national defined contribution plans, decided the firms that did it would be specialized to only working with workers who were saving for retirement, and there'd be a limited number of them. It would be open to anyone that wanted to do it, but given the size of the market, there would be a small number of rather similar firms, similar in that they're tightly regulated. In contrast to that, Sweden has what's referred to as a premium pension. It's a defined contribution plan, it is mandatory, the government runs the website and the record keeping and the collection of taxes uh, for all the individual workers with their own portfolios. The government gives the money to the firm you choose, if you choose a firm, and that firm then handles the assets you accumulate. In the UK, uh, Nest has been created uh, to help with defined contribution plans, and I may get back to that later. So what kinds of issues come up when you consider this? Well, interestingly, um, Australia recently had, not so recently anymore, uh, a major review of how well the pension system worked, and they're still in the process of legislation to try to improve it. And so this is a quote from the government's commission uh, about the issues there. 
Some funds achieve high net returns, but a lot of the products that are offered to the workers who are mandated to buy something, a lot of those do not do well, do much worse than the workers could have done if they went elsewhere. And part of this story is the fees charged by every financial firm, every pension plan, in order to handle the assets. If you, by yourself, just go to some uh, broker and buy some stocks, there are fees associated with that, and fees associated with their keeping track of what you have. And the fees can matter. In fact, one of my messages will be, fees probably matter more than you have been thinking before this lecture. Uh, and a complaint in Australia, which is not an issue in Hong Kong, is there isn't a really good source of information to compare different firms, different portfolios, and help you, help you choose. So the bottom line, inadequate competition, competition by the market in this setting doesn't do a good job. And governance and regulation of these firms by the government agencies has not done a good job in allowing these outcomes. So what's the kind of problem that take us from an idealized competitive market uh, in stocks and bonds uh, and other assets to the reality of what goes on out there. I want to talk about a little of that. So let me start with a familiar example for those of you who are paying attention to the stock market. Uh, an index fund, an index fund also called a tracker fund, uh, holds a set of stocks in a, or bonds in an array of suppliers and automatically preserves the rules for how they hold them. There's no detailed research and choosing, oh, this one looks like a better one, that one looks like a worse one. It's got a rule, it follows the rule. The Standard & Poor Index in the U.S. looks at the 500 largest stocks that are out there and holds them in proportion to their value. So this is very simple, and they're all behaving roughly the same. They're not absolutely identical, but close to it. And they all have fees. So you go to Vanguard, for example, uh, and there are fees for any of the portfolios you buy. What's interesting is the S&P 500 funds are so similar to the, each other in an idealized competitive market, they'd all be charging the same price. That's what you learn in introductory economics. There's a price that clears the market. But what happens, the fee really is the price. It's what they cover their costs and profits with and what you pay out of your earnings so you don't keep all of the earnings. And as you can see, the lighter bars, the fees vary greatly across different firms. And the darker bonds, the lines, are the fees charged not to individuals, but to firms. For example, the pension plan your employer has. And there are two things to notice. One is if you pay your fee through a pension plan run by your employer, the fees typically are lower. The distribution of fees is clearly lower. And the second thing to notice is that even when we are talking about firms doing investment in larger amounts, there's still a range of fees. And there's still not a single price that clears the market. And of course, you're familiar with that. You see gas stations posting prices, and you see different prices on different gas stations. In where I live, there are two gas stations across the street from each other. Some days they have the same prices. Some days they have slightly different prices. It's a little more convenient 
depending which way you're driving to go into one rather than the other. And so a distribution of prices, which is what search theory was all about, is a central part of the way actual markets really work. And I did it again. There we go. So how important are fees? Fees come in two forms. There's a front load fee, an upfront fee, something you pay when you make a new investment, a new contribution to the funds they're holding for you. And the fee takes away the money right up front. Uh, and then there, from that fee, there are no further effects. So if they take 10% of what you put in, uh, you'll have 10% less when you retire, however many years later it is. What happens if you have an annual management fee, which is the widespread common practice in finance industries around the world, they take a little fee every year. So let me go to the bigger number here. They might take 1% each year. And I've heard it said in political arguments about social security reform in the US, 1% it's a small number. It's not worth worrying about. That makes no sense because when you put money in, particularly when you put it in young, that 1% is gonna be collected year after year after year. And the second complication with it is these things compound. It's compound interest that when you get less return in one year, there's less money to earn the return the next year. So ballpark, what you can do as a nice little mathematical simulation is imagine your wages are growing at a constant exponential rate. Assume you're putting a constant fraction of that into your pension and assume there's some earnings rate and some fee year by year. And how much less do you have at the end of a 40 year career from having had a career like that? Uh, and the answer is it multiplies this annual fee by roughly 20, which is half of the 40 year career. And you can see these numbers uh, they're all ballpark, a factor of 20. Uh, obviously, the actual math is slightly different. So fees are a big deal. If you can run a mandatory pension plan with much lower fees, then that's going to give people much larger pensions uh, down the road. The second thing I want to talk about with these is that there are lots of people who are reluctant to pick their own, say, stocks or stock funds. They feel they aren't knowledgeable. Uh, they would like to have someone pick it for them or just as a behavioral thing when they're given a form to fill out to say what they want. Uh, they, in fact, don't fill it out. They don't send it in. So any pension plan has to have a default. If a covered worker who is mandated to put up the money hasn't said what to do with it, the firm has a rule what they do with it. Uh, and I want to... Uh, uh, I want to turn to uh, Sweden where the premium pension, as I said, is a defined contribution, mandatory. Every worker is putting money in every year. And nearly half the Swedes are now in the default fund. And to begin with, um, you couldn't choose to be in the default fund. You could only be in the default fund if you didn't mail in the form and people were encouraged to mail it in, so a lot of people did. Since then, in part because it's younger workers and new workers, there's been a huge growth in reliance on the default, and people who start in the default rarely leave. Some do, 
uh, but many uh, do not. So the Swedes have done an interesting study of people who have been in the market for a long time, what kinds of rates of return do they get? If you ignore that spike uh, fairly high up, uh, just below uh, the 95th percentile line marking, there are only 5% of people having higher returns than that. These are returns over many years. You can see you get the kind of shape you would expect, a bell curve kind of shape, with the exception of the spike. What drives that spike is the people in the default. In other words, the people who make no decisions do better in Sweden than roughly um, 80 or 90 percent of the people who do make a choice. So the default does a good job by avoiding the problems that come from two central elements in thinking about finance. One central element is the problem is complex. What is a good portfolio? How do you change your good portfolio out of time? In part, just because you're aging uh, and retirement is coming closer in part because um, the world is changing. Bonds may look better than stocks or stocks may look better than bonds. And so uh, having that combination of complexity and limited financial sophistication uh, is what moves it. Did I skip one? Yes, I did. Um, I'm sorry, again, this software is not as easy to use. So economists have been studying, finance economists, particularly financial literacy in the public. To what extent do people understand issues about the market? And this is an example of the kind of question that's used. There are a lot of different ones. and asking the question, can you get the answer right on this question? And as you can see, overwhelmingly uh, for uh, the early baby boomers in the US in the sample for this experiment, experiment, they got it wrong. And if you look at the wrong decision they make, basically they're forgetting the compounding that gives you compound interest. I'll leave it to you to check out whether you in fact got it right yourself or not. So how do banks behave? What's the supply side like that uh, affects the complexity of dealing with it? And the answer is it's in the profit-making drive of firms to complicate life. So there was an interesting study of uh, different financial products being offered in Europe over that period, 2002 to 2010. And each of the financial assets study had a headline rate, that is it said, we are aiming for 5%, 4%, pick a number. And then they said, here's what will happen in a good scenario, that's the headline rate, but you've got to recognize there are risks involved. And here is the formula of what you will get if different risks happen. And what they found was that if a supplier of a financial asset gave you a high rate, uh, that probably meant that the fine print of what they actually do in the payoff formula was complicated and involved more risk. So the natural drive of profit-seeking firms uh, is to make it harder for some of them, not all of them, uh, to get evaluated. And particularly that then, as in search theory, makes it harder to do comparisons 
across firms. So I'm going to turn now uh, in the little bit of time I have left to talking about pay-as-you-go pay funding. First, I want to make the point it doesn't mean no funding. Um, here's a list of different countries, and they have different extents to which they do funding. And the extent of funding is a reflection of the decisions made over time about the treatment of different birth cohorts. So a lot of plans, when they started up, uh, they recognized that older workers wouldn't have time to accumulate much. So they were more generous because pensions being a new item, there was a lot of poverty among the elderly, common phenomenon. And that meant there wasn't full funding. And that then carried over. And the decisions about benefits and contributions over time determined how much funding built up over time. So in most countries, what they have done is from time to time, the legislature says, oh, we don't have enough funding, or oh, we have a lot of funding. And then they adjust benefits and they may adjust contributions in response to that. So in the US for many years, starting with the creation in the 30s, up until 1972, let new legislation would change, benefits would change contributions. 1972, the US introduced the first automatics. That's a story that would take another hour, but I wanna to turn to Canada because Canada decided uh, not too long ago that the process of relying on repeated legislation was not a good idea. What Canada decided they would do is build in a semi-automatic, an automatic that would happen unless legislation took care of it. So every three years, the chief actuary of Canada, Canada looks at what they think will happen over the next 75 years. And they ask two questions. Is there enough money to pay benefits throughout the 75 years, given their best guess of how things will go? And secondly, does it look like the funding relative to expenditures will be maintained over the long haul, which is the element that pays attention to the relative treatment of different cohorts? And if the rate that's required in order to protect the pension plan is too low, and if the government doesn't do anything about it, then for the next three years, the contribution rate of young workers, of all workers, goes up. And for those three years, the automatic adjustment of the pension benefit for inflation doesn't happen. So this says, first of all, we've got a red flag. It's not that we go to the legislature and say, you ought to do something about it, and maybe they do and maybe they don't. They're told you do something about it, or the automatic rule that you have legislated in the past will kick in and do it. Uh, this kind of idea is spreading. Uh, there's something similar in the Sweden uh, pay-as-you-go plan, uh, a, no a notional defined contribution plan for those of you familiar with this kind of vocabulary, uh, but more of this would be really good worldwide. Um, the Netherlands has a non-contributory benefit. It's a benefit that goes to everybody of a sufficient age. It's financed out of income taxation. It's not a return for having worked and paid contributions. And of course, as the population is aging and they're collecting the money from income taxes and other sources, uh, they're concerned that it's, the cost is going up too high. So they've put in a rule that says, as life expectancy goes up, the start of this benefit will go up. So it's another example of automatic indexing. It's done on eligibility for a non-contributory benefit. 
I'm almost out of the time I was told uh, to stop, uh, to, to leave time for Q&A, but let me just very quickly run through some slides. If you're going to index on life expectancy, there are a number of different parameters in a standard pension that you could change in that way. And the thing to keep in mind is it's not just an age phenomenon. Once you change the age for full benefits, you change the benefit for anyone collecting at any age. You don't change the benefit for somebody who delays starting benefits to match the indexing. But for any age at which somebody does claim, and a lot of people, some for good reasons, some for bad reasons, claim the benefits as soon as they can, uh, in all of them, there is a drop in benefits as a result of what is labeled merely indexing an age. Indexing an age has implications for benefit levels as well. Um, in the UK, just to wrap up with something close to home for much of the audience, um, the 2008 Act said that each workplace has to provide a pension possibility for the workers. It could be defined benefit, it could be defined contribution. Uh, the worker isn't mandated by the government to be in it. And what happens between the employer and the employee is separate. Uh, but then they recognize that particularly with small firms, the cost of running a pension plan can be a big deal. So they put in place NEST, uh, which any employer can go there and ask NEST to run their pension plan. And NEST as a pension plan offers very limited choice to the investors. It isn't complicated and then a default, it's limited. And that's another good idea. And if you're interested in this topic, uh, there is a book I would recommend uh, together with LSC economist Nick Barr. Uh, it's a few years out of date. We're working on a sequel, uh, but these things take time. Uh, as you can see, uh, this book has been translated in a number of countries where they were having ongoing debates how to change pensions. Uh, and it's been viewed as helpful for clarifying. And I can say it has been used occasionally as a textbook uh, in public economics, public finance classes. So that wraps it up and let's hope we'll have fun in the Q&A. Thank you. Uh, Professor Diamond, thank you so much for all the incredible research and work that you have conducted in your field. Your influential work will continue to inspire like-minded academics for years to come. And I'm sure that, well, I can see that many of the audience members have already had some interesting questions that have been churning in their mind during this talk. So they submitted some questions to Slido, and I'm just going to skip right to the Q&A. So... Uh, our first question that we received is, what do you think about nudges in regards to pension schemes, such as increasing the percentage of income saved within each year? Uh, nudges, I think, are a great idea if done well. Like anything else, um, intervene to help somebody, you as a friend, you as a family member, you as a government, uh, and you can do it well or you can do it badly. So the most common nudge in the pension world is having things that are opt out rather than opt in. If you think of the normal rational model, you give somebody a choice and the person chooses what they like, what fits their preferences. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether exactly how you frame the choice as long as the alternatives are the same. But assume you have two alternatives, which might be in the pension and out of the pension, and you could frame the choice in two different ways. You can 
frame the choices. Do you want to go in? If you want to go in, say yes. The other way you can frame the choice is you are in unless you'd like to get out. If you'd like to get out, say out. So clearly, the alternatives are exactly the same. The effort involved in saying in or saying out uh, is the same. And empirical studies of employer-provided pension plans that shift from being an in basis to an out basis uh, find large changes in behavior. The Swedish premium pension that I mentioned also found that wording things uh, differently as to a default leads to lots of changes. This is not surprising because going back to the limited financial literacy, when you're offered a choice of things you're familiar with, this breakfast cereal or that breakfast cereal, that's on my mind because it's a lot earlier here than where you are, um, you know what's involved in choosing between them. You know what you prefer. You choose the same whether I say it's this one unless you want that one or it's that one unless you want this one. Uh, whereas if you're offered a choice where it's difficult to figure out what's better for you and where you know you have limited ability to judge that, then how it's presented will be a mental shortcut for somebody viewing what's a hard decision for them to make. So the need for nudges is absolutely there. It's clearest in that kind of example. Uh, it's clearest in the example I gave you earlier of being in the default, the default portfolio rather than picking your own portfolio. That's a good nudge if you do a good job on the default portfolio. It's not so good if you do a bad job on the default portfolio. And so we get to the point that any kind of intervention is going to be have to be done well. And even so, will turn out to be a somewhat mixed bag. You can't make it better for everyone. Uh, you can only work at pushing in that direction. Thank you so much for that very comprehensive answer. It's definitely interesting to see how framing things in a different perspective and choosing different defaults can perhaps change people's minds and the way that they make different decisions. So that's very wonderful. Uh, we have another question coming through, which is, given the inversion of demographic pyramids, is income taxation-based pension funding consistent with maintaining debt sustainability? The issue here is how you're going to adapt to a changing situation. So if you have a defined contribution pension, so each worker is putting a fraction of earnings aside and that gets invested and accumulated. And then when you hit re the retirement age, that's used to say buy an annuity or to take monthly withdrawals on. Um, that system still has a need to adapt to aging. Because if you're going to live longer, the question is, what do you do? What do you do differently once you recognize you're going to live longer than maybe you thought before? You've got three options. You can save more at a higher contribution rate. You can work longer and delay the start of benefits or you can have lower benefits. From an individual point of view, those three pieces are the only options in this setup we have of the individual looking after himself or herself. The um, need to adapt is there, whether it's a fully funded by the individual system or not. When Instead of that, you have a collective system. So you're in part, perhaps, accumulating assets and in part using current contributions for benefits and so doing some transfers across different cohorts. 
then you've got the same three questions. Do you want to get larger contributions? Do you want people to work longer? Do you want lower benefits? And the way you adapt to that in this partially funded context um, has important implications for how the burdens get spread across different cohorts. And you might say, well, um, technical progress means future workers will be richer. They can share some of that with older people. Think of that as a form of risk sharing across cohorts. Or you could say the flip, climate change means we're going to have lots of problems down the road. Uh, and the ability of the working generation to deal with climate change and finance production uh, and pensions, uh, that's going to be a difficulty. This is an issue where um, there are very important intergenerational elements involved. They're important around climate change. They're important around pension design. And there isn't a simple answer that says, oh, this is the right answer for any country. In different countries, the cohorts will have different relationships with them. The future will look brighter or less bright differently. Uh, and so an important element is each country needs to recognize the importance of this, the complications at, of designing policy to fit with it, and to fit the policy to the social preference country by country. Yeah, absolutely. Tailoring it to a different country approach is very, very important in designing this kind of solution. So we still have quite a bit of time for the Q&A session. And our next question that's come in is, how can countries with low fertility rates and aging populations manage the pressure on pensions? <laughs> uh, there's an obvious answer to that. It's called immigration. <laughs> and insofar as um, dealing not just with pensions, but with production and output and maintaining highways and all sorts of things in a country. If a country is concerned about a shrinking population and it's a country with high productivity, uh, there are around the world lots of people who will move for a good job. So that's one item that's there. That doesn't speak to the issue of what the poorer countries need to do. Uh, there, the aging is not nearly as sharp as in the advanced countries, but it's happening there as well. So that calls for an increased focus by the world generally on improving development uh, as a response to uh, aging happening pretty much everywhere. Yeah, that's incredibly interesting that perhaps immigration might be a solution in countries where productivity is high and job opportunities are readily available, but how perhaps for countries where that is not necessarily the case, there are other solutions that we may perhaps need to consider. So great. Um, our next question is, how can countries who are wishing to reform their pension system to a more efficient one uh, deal with things like public strikes and protests such as those seen in France recently? <laughs> well, first, let me say I'm an economist, not a political scientist. Uh, and uh, um, obviously, I've paid very close attention to political process in the U.S. Uh, and a little bit of attention uh, in France. I was actually uh, giving lectures on pensions in Paris just before COVID struck, when there were strikes about the government proposals at the time. Uh, I was doing a seminar uh, at the Treasury and at a university. Uh, so I'm aware that this is delicate. And the point is, there's an important element of education, of information, uh, to begin by making people aware what the alternatives are. Because 
a lot of the public wants more government spending and lower taxes and doesn't quite address the fact that they are connected since debts have limits from the government point of view. So the point here is to start a process where the public gets educated on what are the real alternatives. It's not, if it's put as, here's our plan, like it or not like it, but it's rather, here's our problem. What are the alternatives for addressing the problem? And what do you, the individual who will be affected by it, uh, think about the different pieces, recognizing that different people are going to be affected differently. And this is a national problem, which relies on uh, the complexities. I'm talking obviously about democratic countries, the complexities that come with any government decision making in a democracy, because there are always people who prefer a different alternative. And the issue is how you work out the choice across the alternatives at a time when different people have different views. Good democracy gets into engaging the public in the debate so that it's not a my way or the highway kind of mindset being as widespread as it might otherwise be. Yeah, a very interesting link between economics and politics there. I think it's definitely worth exploring that further as well. And I think we have time for one more question. And this is probably one that is uh, going to be very commonly asked, asked in this current situation. How do you think inflation is going to affect those on fixed incomes and hence those living on a pension? And what do you think we can do about that? Okay. Um, inflation is a topic that comes up a lot, of course. Uh, and there are two aspects to it. One and is what the central bank ought to be doing related to how much of what's going on comes from the level of aggregate demand. Um, and what else, how much would central bank actions affect how that plays out. And the second dimension is, what's the role of the rest of the government in, call it disaster relief or distributional attention um, for dealing with the inflation to the extent you live with it, because destroying, going into a severe recession is something if you can avoid it you want to and if you do avoid it that may mean that inflation is going to come down much slower than the public would like and an important element here to keep in mind is a lot of the data that macroeconomists look to about the connection between inflation and unemployment uh, and central bank actions comes from a history of inflations that came about through the aggregate demand channel, whether it was a government spending too much or central banks having too low interest rates or other kinds of aggregate demand shocks or aggregate supply shock like the oil shock. What we are having now, very visibly in the UK, also very visible in the US, but rather differently, is a shock that is coming from a different place. So the UK is marked right now by lots of strikes. Strikes, when they get settled, will often involve higher wages and better treatment for workers that will pull up costs, will affect prices. You don't want to say this is just too much aggregate demand. The experience around COVID has had a big impact on the thinking 
of workers the thinking of firms. And so we're seeing something where the inflation, some of the inflation, is being driven out of the labor market, not being driven out of aggregate demand. In the US, we're much less unionized. We do have some strikes happening. Uh, more visibly in the US is we do have uh, a spread of unionization happening. And we do have a lot of individuals who are quitting jobs and going elsewhere. We have the monthly quit rate well above what it has been historically. So inflation in part is being driven by labor market phenomena and not just aggregate demand. And if you address it by saying aggregate demand is the problem, aggregate demand is the solution, I fear a central bank doing that will make a mess. The central bank has to recognize insofar as this is coming from the labor market, the ability to bring down inflation without severe unemployment is limited. And we should do two things. We should make sure inflation doesn't pick up because of aggregate demand. We should be doing a bit of pushing on that. But we should recognize that bringing inflation down to the level central banks would like ought to be viewed as a slow motion phenomenon, not we want to do it as quickly as we can. And that slow motion phenomenon will give room for the labor market phenomena to slowly work their way out, which is going to take time. And because that's happening, back to your question, there are things that are not central bank jobs, but rather than that, are the job of the central government finances, the treasury, in terms of providing more resources for people who are particularly being hard hit by what's going on. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Diamond. It's definitely very interesting to see that inflation does not necessarily stem from aggregate demand, but rather the labor market side, and that it is not necessarily the central bank's responsibility to provide these solutions either. So thank you, everyone, for your brilliant questions today, and to Professor Peter Diamond for answering all of them in such a detailed and nuanced manner. Um, what an honor it has been to host you at the Warwick Economic Summit here today. Uh, thank you so much. And can everyone Thank please you for having me. Thank you.